Today, it's budget tech on a high mileage Cherokee. We're using a chassis ear to diagnose hard to find suspension problems. Then it's how to make an easy service diff cover and how to revive our Jeep's faded plastic parts. It's all today here on Truck Tech. Now, if you've ever had a noise coming from underneath your vehicle somewhere, but you can't pinpoint exactly where it's coming from, you know how frustrating that can be. You know it's a part that's either failed or it's failing and it's not going to fix itself. Now, this 01 Jeep Cherokee belongs to a guy that works with us, and he's been telling me for the last couple of months about this clunky noise coming from somewhere in the front end that he can't exactly locate and fix. So today we're going to use a couple of tools to try to fix this thing. That way he can avoid spending 80 or 100 bucks an hour to pay somebody else to maybe hear what he's talking about and maybe fix the right thing. Now, obviously, we're going to get our Cherokee up on the lift and give it a good hands on mechanical inspection. But since I'm told this is a hard to find noise, we're also going to enlist the help of this wireless chassis ear that we picked up from Matco. Basically, these four different transmitters get clamped to different components in the general area of where the noise is coming from on the vehicle. Then these clamps transmit any vibration, slack, or frequency into the receiver. And you can see by tapping on the number four clamp, I'm not getting any audio or visual clue from that signal. Number two channel, same thing. Number three, nothing. Number four, good solid signal. You can see how sensitive it is. Let's get this thing hooked up. All right, now I've checked everything out and everything seems to be in pretty good shape despite having over 250,000 miles on it. Some of the tie rod ends might have a slight amount of play, but probably not enough to cause the clunking noise. Now I've checked everything else over, can't find any obvious source of the noise, so let's get the chassis ear hooked up, take this thing for a road test. First transmitter will clamp to the steering box, just strap it to the sway bar. Good enough for our road test. The second one will clamp here near the track bar connection. Third one, this lower control arm here. This fourth one will go here on the frame side or body side of the track bar mount. Just secure it to the sway bar. These suckers turned on and hit the road. All right, with the four transmitters at different points underneath the vehicle, we can cycle through the four different channels and try to pinpoint where the noise is coming from and help us with the diagnosis. All right, swerve back and forth, try to get this thing to make some noise, replicate the issue. All right, on signal one or channel one, I'm barely picking up anything. It's this. It's a slight noise, but I don't think it's. I don't think that's the one. All right, switch to channel two. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a lot more prevalent on channel two. Yeah, every time we change directions, I hear I hear the pretty solid clunk. All right, make a note of that. Channel two is pretty strong. Yeah, every time we change direction. All right, I'm gonna switch to channel three. I think this is the one mounted on the control arm, and I'm not picking up anything. It's probably pretty well isolated, the rubber glitching. All right, let me try four. And swerve back and forth again like you were. And there's some, a little something there, but it's not much. It's definitely strongest on two, so we've probably isolated it to whatever's close to the number two receiver. All right, now on channel one and channel four, I'm picking up very faint signals very slight audio and visual cues. On channel three, I'm getting almost nothing, just kind of like road noise coming through. In channel two, that's where it's the strongest, so more than likely our problem is close to that number two transmitter. All right, now after a quick test drive, well, it was pretty clear that the majority of the noise we were hearing was coming from the area near this number two transmitter, which was right at the base of the track bar mount. And the video confirmed it, that this track bar was moving around a little bit. And if you look really close, you can see some shiny metal where even the bolt was moving around a little bit. Now, you would think that we could fix that just by tightening up that track bar bolt, but I've also picked up a little bit of play in the tie rod end 
at the frame end of the track bar. No side to side play, but enough up and down play to definitely need replacement. I've also picked up a little bit of play in some of the other tie rod ends as well. So we're gonna get some new front end parts ordered, get this thing fixed up. After the break, we'll install our new steering linkage and later we'll modify the diff cover to make gear oil changes easy. Stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Well, now that we've got our hard to find suspension noise diagnosed, it's time to fix the problem. Now, since this Jeep Cherokee is just a daily driver on stock size tires and wheels, well, there's no point in putting heavy duty aftermarket components on it. Stock replacement parts are more than satisfactory and budget was a concern as well. So we went to rockauto.com and picked up a bunch of parts. We've got a new drag link, tie rod, track bar, rod ends, adjustment sleeves, and we even picked up a couple of new shocks just to freshen up the front end all at once. So let's throw some parts on here. Grab some tools. Now teardown is pretty straightforward. And luckily for us, we didn't have to fight any rust or corrosion, despite having many, many miles on this thing. I was able to separate the tie rod ends with a swift smack of a hammer, but on the steering linkage where it attaches to the pitman arm, I didn't want to risk damaging the box. So after removing the tie rod and nut, I separated the joint using a pickle fork we got from Matco. There we go. Actually, I'm gonna put this back on here so it doesn't hit the floor. Just a couple of threads. Now the steering stabilizer, believe it or not, is still in pretty good shape, so we're gonna reuse it. I'll just have to transfer it over to the new drag link. Now to disconnect the track bar, you need to loosen up the bolt and don't lose the flag nut on the back side of it. If you lose it or break it, you can use a regular nut, but the flag nut is convenient. Then we can get started installing some new parts, starting with the new track bar. Now to help center up the axle and locate the track bar and line up the bolt, I'm using a heavy duty ratchet strap. Now once you get the flag nut started on the back side of the bolt, it becomes a one tool operation, which is nice. It's good for now, I'm gonna wait till the weight is on the vehicle before I tighten that completely. And when installing these new parts, don't forget that sometimes you've got to install the Zerk fittings yourself. And even though these tie rod ends are new, it's also a good idea to give them a couple of shots of grease, even though they come pre lubed And don't forget the cotter pins on all the castellated nuts. And the last piece on our steering refresh is the steering stabilizer. A little persuasion won't fix. And with everything tightened down, I can remove the ratchet strap and get to work installing those new set of shocks. Now these are just budget friendly replacement shocks, but at least they don't have a quarter of a million miles on them. All right, tighten everything up, we're done. All right, now with the weight on the vehicle, I went ahead and tightened down the track bar bolt, and all we've got left to do is a rough toe-in alignment since we messed with the steering linkage. Then we can drive it to the alignment shop, and we'll be done. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Now with the front suspension kind of all buttoned up, we're gonna shift our focus to the rear axle of this Cherokee and do a little maintenance like changing out the gear oil. Now on a lot of vehicles, the differential has both a fill plug and a drain plug, making servicing pretty easy. This thing only has a diff cover that you have to remove to drain the fluid, but it does have a fill plug. So we're gonna remove the cover, let all the old fluid drain out, but before we reinstall the cover, we're gonna add a drain plug to make servicing that much easier. Gear oil doesn't look too old, that's good. Thank you. 
Now, I didn't expect this cover to fall off, but it's a little more stubborn than normal. Goodness gracious. No wonder. Look at that. Looks like somebody's a little heavy-handed with the RTV there. This thing's got a little tumor on our rear axle. Now, to clean off the sealant, I'm using a bristle disc on a die grinder. It does a good job of getting rid of the RTV without getting into the metal surface. Now, our little homemade drain plug is nothing more than a 7 16 bolt and nut that I've cut down to the right length and a little copper washer so things seal up without any special gaskets or sealers. Now, for the location of our drain plug, well, we obviously want it on the bottom of the diff cover so we can get all the old fluid out. But we need to stay away from the ring gear, which is about right here on the diff cover. So I think anywhere in between these two bolt holes will be fine. I think that'll be a good spot right there. And after drilling a small pilot hole, I switched up to a step bit. It worked really well at drilling metal less than an eighth of an inch thick. If you don't have one, you might want to add one to your arsenal. Then we scuffed off some of the diff cover paint so we could weld the nut into position. Then we broke out the wire brush, cleaned things up a little bit, and followed that with a little degreaser and a Scott Pro Shop towel because we got the diff cover off, might as well paint it. This little duplicolor black makes this thing look like new. Then we reinstalled the drain plug with a copper washer and snugged things down. Little Loctite RTV to seal this thing back up. A little less than that was on here. Not quite as much. We're not gluing it back together, just sealing it. Now you could leave this bead of RTV alone, but I like to spread it out evenly on the flange. Then I texturize it just to use that as an indicator on whether I've got enough RTV or too much. If need be, I can correct things. And here's one final tip. All right, now we've got our drain plug installed. We've got our RTV down. Last thing we're gonna do is drop in this small magnet onto the cover so any metal particles floating around in the gear lube get attracted to the magnet and stay there instead of getting up in your bearings and gears. Now our new drain plug is gonna make servicing the diff easier. Another thing that makes it easier is our mode of products power fill fluid transfer pump. Simply pressurize the container, open up the valve, and our royal purple gear lube flows automatically. All right. Just a little double check here. Yep, we fold the rubber plug. I'm done with that part anyway. Now, since this Cherokee is essentially a commuter vehicle, it doesn't tow anything, it doesn't have a screaming V8 under the hood or giant tires and wheels, there's no need for really aggressive brake pads or slotted and dimpled rotors. Stock replacement parts are more than adequate. So we picked up some of EBC's Ultimax pads and their stock replacement rotors with their new black Geomet coating. And with the old brakes out of the way, I'm prepping for installation by getting rid of any rust on the hub to make sure that the rotor sits nice and flat. Now we had some uneven pad wear. That's due to this indentation here on the caliper guide. What's happening is the inboard pad is basically hinging on that low spot, causing the pads to wear unevenly. And rather than deal with the uneven pad wear or replace the entire steering knuckle, we're gonna fix it with a couple of tack welds. Then we just ground them down so they were flat. Now the bottom had a low spot too. We fixed that as well. It just wasn't as bad as the top. And with it repaired, you can see that the pads now move freely along the guides. To finish things up, we applied a little EBC anti-seize to the pads, installed them in the caliper, and hung it over the rotor. Then we cleaned up and lubricated the caliper mounting pins. It's what allows the caliper to slide back and forth on the mount. All right, got the boots back on, we're done. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Well, now that we've got this thing in good solid shape mechanically, we're not gonna let it out of the shop without taking care of a few cosmetic issues. For you guys that have owned Jeeps from this era, you know that the plastic fender flares and some of the trim work and bumper caps, well, they fade from a good looking black plastic to this dull, chalky, gray looking plastic. 
In addition to that, well, this Jeep was involved in a little bit of an accident and the right rear fender flare needed to be replaced. But rather than try to paint that one to match the body color, we're just going to paint all four flares in a nice black, along with the trim work and a couple of the bumper caps. Now, before I even get started taping things off or scuffing the fender, I'm wiping everything down with a wax and grease remover. If I didn't, I would just be grinding contaminants into the texture I'm creating with a scuff pad. I taped things off around the painted surface so I didn't damage it with the scuff pad. And after applying the masking tape, we can apply a little masking paper. And if you're doing a job like this at home and you don't have professional masking paper, well, a roll of tape and a newspaper will get you to the same spot. It just might take you a little bit longer. Now with everything wiped down and dried, I'm hitting everything with a light coat of adhesion promoter to help the paint stick to the plastic. It doesn't take much, but I am doing two light coats. The scuff pad gives the fenders the mechanical adhesion it needs to stick and the adhesion promoter helps provide a chemical adhesion. So we should end up with pretty durable results. And for the actual coating, I'm applying it in three different steps. The first coat was a light mist coating. The second was a medium wet coating. And the third was a little heavier yet for full coverage. Now the product is Duplicolor's bumper coating, but it's given us great results on the fender flares and the rubber impact strips. Now, if these bumper caps or any of the parts have ever been wiped down with a tire shine type product, make sure you're extra thorough in the cleaning. Otherwise, you'll have a hard time getting paint to stick to it. And just like the rest of the parts, we're hitting these with two coats of their adhesion promoter. And following it with a couple of coats of the actual bumper coating. Since these were already black or kind of black to start with, two coats is sufficient. Let it dry and we'll be ready for reinstallation. All right, well, this high mileage Cherokee has a freshened up front suspension and it looks a lot better than it did when we started. And the cosmetic fix only cost us a couple hours of our time and a few cans of Duplicolor. I'm really digging that black satin look. It's like a new one. Now, if you're in the market for a remanufactured 4.7 liter V8 for your Dodge or Jeep vehicle, you need to check out powertrain products. Now, what separates them from other rebuilders, they don't just bring the engine back to factory specs and call it done. In addition to that, they also make improvements and updates along the way, like installing updated tensioners and guides for the timing chain and installing the better multi-layer steel head gaskets. They also address the failure-prone valve seats that plague these 4.7s. Check it out. The factory installed powdered metal valve seats have a tendency to fall out of the cylinder head, causing catastrophic damage. So during the remanufacturing process, Powertrain Products installs a solid metal seat, eliminating that failure point. So if you're in the market for a 4.7 or any other engine, check out Powertrain Products. Their engines are dyno tested and backed up by a four year, million mile parts and labor warranty. Guys, thanks for watching Truck Tech. See you next time.